Welcome to the George Lynch Hunting Podcast, brought to you by Legendary Gear, the game call company that is legend by design. Well, you guys out there, this is the podcast for you. If you're a duck hunter, if you had the season that everybody everybody had their opinion and what happened during the season, well, this is the podcast. We have the man. We have the guy here, Doug Osborne, the uh, head biologist of the University of Arkansas. We got him on the podcast today, Doug. We're going to ask him the, the questions and listen to his response of everybody's questions. What happened to the Mallards this year? So, hey, Doug, it's great to have you on board, bud. Yeah, good morning, George. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you, my friend. Um, I know we were sitting there talking. We've been gone turkey hunting. I was out scouting this morning. It's uh, It's been a great year, but you had a little tough time, you were telling me, in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I needed uh, I needed to get away from the the ducks and uh, <laughs> and uh, so we I, I went over in Tennessee before a meeting uh, conference I had in Nashville for a couple of days, USDA meeting, and went over and, and tried to chase them on public land over there for a while. And it, uh, you know, they got they got a good bit of hunters over there. I found out so uh, a lot of turkeys, a lot of turkey signs, uh, beautiful woods this time of year. Of course, you got to be thankful to be in God's creation, regardless if you kill a turkey or not. Uh, had a blast. Uh, had some opportunities at some jakes, but let them on walk until next year. And uh, but uh, never did get on a gobbler. Wow, it's tough. Tough. It's um, Tennessee. You know, it's there's a lot of hunters. I've a lot of guys I I've talked to that go to Tennessee or from Tennessee. It, it has to be pr- pretty close to one of the number one states. I would bet for uh, turkey pressure and the amount of turkey hunters. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Folks, hey, if you like this, please hit the like button and also subscribe to our podcast. Doug, I'm not gonna beat around the bush i know you're a busy man which is a good thing for us duck hunters we got a great guy and a great team in our corner but i'm gonna let you go ahead and talk about the 2023 season of uh of ducks and in what uh, you have seen and what it looks like for the future oh yeah the magic question here we go Uh, i mean it was down again huh um didn't it wasn't a great year uh i don't you know, there's some little spots of places in Arkansas that had decent years, but I think overall, flyway wide, central and Mississippi, mid continent wide, we probably were down again. Um, and I mean, it was expected. I mean, you know, we had, we went from nine, 10 million mallards, you know, six, seven years ago to, you know, just, just under six, six million. So, I mean, we've, we're, you know, we're 40, 45% decline in population uh and so we expect to see less birds on the landscape uh you know um the the population the distribution of these birds is like an amoeba you know the bigger it gets the wider that thing spreads and everybody gets a little bit of love here and there but when that you know that population shrinks that distribution shrinks you got you got fringes of that distribution that may or may not even see birds uh, whereas the core of that distribution is just seeing lots and lots of less birds. So, I mean, we're, our population is down, I'd say 40% given the, given a survey number. So, you know, we expected, uh, we've expected, I mean, I keep telling these people, I do a bunch of seminars and I go to a bunch of hunt clubs around Missouri, Arkansas before season. I said, listen, you guys, y'all got to manage your expectations because we're down again. And so, um, you know, we were four, five, six years in a row, you know, that trend is continues to trends down. And so our numbers are down. Um, and so there's lots of things to, you know, there's not lots of fingers to point there and, and, and why, um, and, uh, you know, and so, you know, we're seeing, I mean, mid January, it was interesting just watching some of the posts on, on social media, you see a big raft of ducks sitting in a in a creek in in michigan you know and uh of course those aren't our birds here in arkansas but i mean on january 15th you got a big huge raft of mallards sitting in a creek in michigan it's like why are they not migrating and i mean there's lots of things to explain this right there's there's obviously some uh, patterns in weather that kind of 
uh, that can kind of move birds. But we, you know, a lot of our research lately is showing that, you know, historically when we get excited about weather patterns, we say, yep, it's time, birds are going to move. You know, we're not seeing the, 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 the southern, the fall, winter migrations associated with climate events anymore. Like a lot of our transmitter data aren't showing that. Wow. I mean, this year... I mean, this year, and we had a, we marked a bunch of tra- we put a bunch of transmitters on hen mallards in Missouri, um, and we had um, we had that ice storm. We had that that freeze up. When was it this year? Uh, late December, maybe late December, January. We had that that freeze up that we had. The birds that we had with transmitters on in Missouri, you know where they went? They went to Illinois. And they went they north. Went to- Wow. They went to the Illinois, well, they went east. They went to the Illinois River Valley. Is it because there's more river systems and and maybe nuclear power plants and stuff like that? I I guess, like, you would expect the ice storm to come, the weather events to come, to push the birds south. We we didn't see the southern migration on these transmitters. We've seen a bunch of them just shift to the river systems. And they literally went to the Illinois River Valley. And so, you know, we're just, we're seeing changes in behaviors of, of migratory behaviors. Um, you know, and there's a lot of genetic research going on now looking at the, you know, the prevalence of the, of the, of the game farm genetics in the wild mallard populations. And so we're concerned that we're just getting higher and higher proportions of, of game farm genetics in the populations. It's causing these birds to be, you know, to be bigger bodied, smaller wings, their bill shapes are mm. changing according to some preliminary data that they're finding in Texas uh, on this. The, uh, the geneticist is doing all this work. And so it's like, you know, we're seeing lots of changes and, and we think that, you know, we think that this genetic variation, uh, this game farm genetics getting into wild bird populations, sort of condensing these birds in the shorter migration routes, uh, and they're just and they're hanging out longer. And so there's just there's really just tons of factors that, to point at uh, in terms. But I do say that we have the data to demonstrate sort of. Uh, changes in in, in in the migratory behaviors that's interesting you know because in the goose uh, in the goose uh, world we noticed that years ago when you know that southern illinois or southern illinois used to be the mecca uh when geese would migrate down there and everybody went to southern illinois to guide to hunt and because they just migrated there and then that started coming to you know years ago that started uh you know they started hanging back with more open waters and everything in chicago area and that, that area in northern Illinois seemed to start holding more of the birds. And, you know, definitely yeah. it holds, the, they got to have the open water. But I here's a thought to throw out there that, you know, if, if and once that, you know, you got imprinting going on with those, whether it's domestication or whatever, it's it's being infiltrated in that, that they start, they don't, they don't have to travel. So, you know, in the northern part, usually our duck season is shut down. Um, way before the southern is going and that's usually because the southern drags on because that's where the ducks end up but i'm wondering if that is kind of hurting us and shooting ourselves in the foot because you know it doesn't take long the imprint of you know hey if i have open water and i got food and nobody's banging at me why am i going to travel down to the south you know it used to be that you know hunting pressure will definitely move birds and and the opportunity of of you know of uh, open water and in food availability, but if they're not being banged at, you know, it <laughs> it's hard to get them to leave. Yeah. So, do you think there's any possibility of that? Yeah. It, it, maybe the northern yeah. uh, the northern states that they open later and and stay open to help maybe push those birds back south. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, George, you know this, but um, you knew I grew up in Illinois. But I mean, you know, that where you're at in Illinois, I mean, they don't get they don't get the six and eight inch ice anymore that they no. once did. You know, it froze and it's froze all winter, and then you get snow cover and you got ice and snow cover. There's no no food to birds move. Now we get a little ice event that lasts three or four days, and then it thaws out again. And during that ice event, half the time you don't even have snow, so the birds can still access food. Um, you know, energetically, it's more beneficial for them just to hunker down and don't spend any energy. 
that's their body style. They're going to get to the winter ground. They're going to fatten up. They're going to stuff some fat reserves in corners of their body. So when they need it and they don't have food, they go, they can live for a few days. Right. And so energetically, they just need to hunker down. This is what we've seen. We've, we've studied this on, uh, with a group from Tennessee, Colin's lab and I, and I had worked together on a, a couple of papers, uh, looking at what are these birds doing during these extreme weather events, these huge ice events that, that last, how long do they, are they, do they, does the extreme weather event push them out? Cause we know this sort of northern normal sort of weather, uh, patterns don't, don't seem to move them. Uh, and so we studied that and, 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 and we found that these birds will hunker down for four five, six days before. And at some point they're going to nearly starve to death. And then they, if it's still froze, they got to go. But for the front end of that storm, it's best that they hunker down. And so, I mean, we just, we found so much just energy conservation. These birds are going through, they're trying to save their stored energy during that event because these, you know, because these storms and, the, and these cold spells are, are not lasting as long as they, as they once did. We're not getting as thick and hard as ice as we once did. And so, you know, these, these birds are adapting to that and they, and they know, and they're going to sit it out and wait and, you know, it's better than leaving and going trying to find somewhere else that may or may not be froze or may or may not have food for them, you know, and then they spend a bunch of energy getting there. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting mm-hmm. you say that. But when we uh, when I lived and had my shop with Lynch Bob Calls in, in Michigan, I lived right with two uh, waterfowl hunt clubs in my backyard and we were right off the of Lake Erie. And uh, I remember our biologist there. Uh, it was our late season of goose that came in, and we had gotten some storms. But, you know, this is southern Michigan, northern Ohio. And back at the hunt club, we found several ducks that were dead. That had, we figured they must have starved to death. Just like you said, they, they hunkered down and, and just thought they'd wait the, the cold instead of taking the natural of, of flying south. But, you know, we found in southern farm ground, we found dead ducks from star, uh, starving that didn't move out of the storm. Yeah, yeah, that we found that same thing when we were doing a teal greenwing teal project a few years ago. We had devices and we found a device that looked like it was dead in a ditch. And we went and looked at it, and there were about 40 or 50 dead teal laying in that creek. And so they all piled in there, hunkered down, tried to conserve energy, and they starved to death. Yeah, wow. Yep. So, what's the answer? Uh, well, I mean, it, it you know, the the you know, the extreme weather events seem to maybe getting more frequent a bit. And the in the in the moderate sort of winter events and the moderate Arctic fronts that kind of push through aren't enough to freeze and cover cover the ground in snow and move the birds. And so, you know, they're changing. Uh you know, they're they're the risk of moving during those during any migration event because of the high hunting pressure across the landscape too is you know, that there's that risk, that trade off, uh, you know, uh, that they need to strategize as a, as an individual that wants to increase fitness and the ability to, to, you know, carry got- his genetics on and to breed. And so, I mean, I, I think they're just, I think we're just seeing lots of behavioral changes in birds that, you know, what can we, you know, we can't do much about sort of these weather events, but and you and I've talked in the past, and, and I, I've got this has just got to be tough for you and your team. So you're trying to, you know, you we had spoke, you know, that COVID was was really hurt with those couple of years in COVID that you weren't allowed, you know, to to attain any information. So when we came out of that trend and we were going to get back in the cycle, we really didn't know where we're going to be because of COVID. And so you get to, you know. Where does one draw the line to, to know that, okay, we're down 40%, but is that 40% because, number one, they're not migrating? Or is it, two, we have a depletion of uh, ducks, maybe from, you know, whether they're having that avian flu or I don't know. Well, yeah. Well, that 40% decline is from population surveys on the breeding grounds. Gotcha. Yeah. So we know that's that's abundance. I mean, that's a that's a that's a reflection of abundance. In, anyway, I would say I would say in those in those 
data that the Fish and Wildlife Service produced, and I think they would agree that the the actual estimate, the number itself, is probably you know has a lot of air in it, has some air in it, but it's the trends that we're seeing from year right. to year. Yep, that's very important, and that we continue. We know there's there's some uh, some assumptions that we have to make in making those estimates, but as long as we consistently do it, we know that those trends is, is what's important. And the trend line in the last six years is 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 about the uh you know is about the slope of the roof of your house um you know and how much longer can it continue to go and so everybody continues to say it's habitat related it's breeding habitat related well it's going to come back but we continue to drain wetlands in canada the weather continuously gets gets warmer we're planting nut all trees in missouri and, and areas that never really had all that many nut alls before and so we're seeing species shift in north we're seeing duck species shift in north but we're also seeing plants and trees and everything else that can live further north that never once lived there so now we're growing grains further north that never i mean i there i was at this conference in nashville and they're talking about growing rice in wisconsin i was going to uh, say where they're going right? to grow rice and not, yeah and it, it not the wild rice i mean they're they're talking about planting cultivated rice grains in wisconsin and it's like hey when does this happen and so you know we continue to see those patterns and changes and and so we're you know we're at the point where you know we really do have we we really do have a decline in population and it likely is i'm on this i am definitely on the habitat train uh that i believe it's it's related to breeding habitat conditions but when are we going to get a hold on it like there's two components. There's one that we can't control so much, the weather and the rainfall and the snowfall that's going to fill these ponds. But the drainage of these prairie ponds and the, and the, and the, and the tillage of the grasslands associated with all these ponds, we can control. So if they continue to say, you know, harvest doesn't matter, that it's that population dynamics is driven by prairie breeding habitat, when are we going to get the prairie breeding habitat under control to the point where these populations can rebound? My my story, my case is harvest does matter when populations get this low because if we keep harvesting birds at the same rate that we are and we keep, uh, you know, we're just, if we if we would back off harvest slightly, to the point where we're sort of stockpiling some populations. So when the breeding habitat's right, we have this extra group of birds that will, you know, that are rebound to that, to that goal that we want that population to be at. That rebound will be quicker the more birds we have on the landscape. And so that's my argument uh, in terms of, of, of sort of adjusting harvest slightly. I, I, I'm not saying that har- change in harvest regulations is going to fix this decline in population because it's not. But it, I think that it will help in that rebound when prairie, prairie uh, wetland conditions uh, are improved. That to me, I, I have to agree. I have to say that the the breeding conditions and getting because we I noticed here the two worst years of waterfowl that I've noticed, and we've been in two of the worst drought uh, stages. Now we're getting pounded with rain and storms, and hopefully that will fill back up. But you know, like you said, in in Canada and in the Dakotas, you know, we're you're, you're losing some of these potholes and breeding grounds, and you know it. it cutting numbers i'm looking at this as, as like a sensible like well you know if i have my worst season uh and the ducks weren't here you know cutting my numbers or cutting the season down isn't going to make one dent because i'm not shooting ducks anyway um yeah you know i i, I can see yeah. that and or maybe you keep if you do shorten the season you shorten the front end and keep the back yeah. end well, well, nobody, nobody wants a short season. We were born to be a field, George, I, and, and I know you, uh, and I know me, and I want to be in the damn field. Absolutely. Right? And so I don't want my days shorter. Yeah, scares I'd that guy out of me. Field, I'd rather go out in the field and kill two ducks every day 100%. than going out 
30 days and killing six. I don't need six ducks a day. I agree a hundred percent. Let me buddy. go out and shoot two ducks. I would be happy. Know? And yeah. so that's, that's, you know, but, but again, the population dynamics, the population ecologists don't quite sort of support the fact that, you know, reduced harvest, you know, will increase populations. But I think if that prairie habitat gets, you know, improved over the next couple of years, I would think that rebound from 6 million birds or five and a half million birds to, to nine or 10, which is where we kind of all want to be, you know, would be that growth back up to nine, 10 million birds would be, you know, would be a rap, more rapid increase would be more exponential curve. And my and sort of, that's just my simple brain. And that's what I think, think about. And so, but you know, it's, I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's just, it's just hard. It's, it's, it's hard to think about uh, all the drivers to what's influencing these populations and what's really going to have the best bang for our buck in terms of restoring population abundance back up to what we want. And like you said, losing it with COVID, we, we, you know, we kind of got behind the eight ball being able to obtain this knowledge, but, but during the, the flyways, are, is it pretty much equal across all the flyways in this decrease or are certain flyways more hit than others? Uh, I would say I'm way more in tuned in the central Mississippi flyway, of course, than the, than the coasts. Uh, but I would say, I'd say, I mean, we're sharing, a, we're sharing a good, I mean, we're sharing our birds here in the mid continent. Right. And so, right. um, I would, I would suspect the whole mid continent is down. Um, there's no shift West. Uh, so your listeners can get over this fact that are the birds shifting to Oklahoma? Is that why they're not in Arkansas, Missouri, or whatever else? It's yeah, not I hear happening. that. Like I just, I have zero evidence. I have zero data that supports that, and it's really not happening. And I think it's just a, you know, it's just a word of mouth that everybody's going to run over to Oklahoma and there's a bunch of spots over there. Now all of a sudden it's gotten a popular place and it's, it's opened up, but it's, it, we're not really seeing a shift West or East. We're definitely seeing a shift, you know, toward more towards the mid continent in, in our overall harvest. Yeah. That's probably thanks to social media and outfitters in Oklahoma telling you that ducks are here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Yeah. What well, about other, I mean, con- it's, go yeah. ahead. Nope, I'm done. What about other countries like New Zealand and stuff? Are they seeing this kind of effect? You know, because they got mallards and they got Canada geese. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know how well I can speak on that, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think overall, though, globally, we're probably seeing less and less migration. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks that hunt, uh, Argentina and, uh, it just appears down there too, that they're concerned about overall numbers. They're concerned about, um, you know, how many can we be harvesting and be, be sustainable. And, and, and I hear a lot about, it seems like patterns in migration, uh, you know, our local movements are changing because really a lot of those birds aren't sort of continental wide migrants like we're dealing with here. And yeah. And, um, and so, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of change. I think a lot of it is, is, is a lot of it's climate related climates, climate, climates probably what's driving our ability to drain more wetlands. Right. And so I think a lot of it points back to really to climate, um, uh, uh, some of the changes that's going on here, but, um, I but yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing some, you know, some concerning, concerning, concerning numbers, um, you know, and none of us, none of us want to hear that. I mean, we hate it because we, us sportsmen spend all of our wife's money on, on <laughs> everything hunting that we possibly can, you know, we're supporting the resource the best we can. And, and so we want to make sure that the science and the policymakers are making the appropriate decisions to, you know, to keep populations where we want them and, and so that we can maintain hunting seasons and, and, uh, you know, and so there's, there's just, there's a lot of talk around the way that hunting seasons are set right now using the adaptive harvest management approach, you know, and when that, that's sort of a framework to say, 
you know, if the number of breeding ponds is fits in this box and the number of, uh, of, of, uh, pair birds found on the ponds fall here this is this is what your hunting season is going to be so they're you know so it's, it's sort of a structured approach that takes a lot of the subjectivity out of the decision um and uh but that framework was not was not put in place uh to support as much to pop uh, the excuse me that framework really doesn't uh it was set to uh to maximize opportunity for hunters and so we're trying to provide as much hunting opportunity as possible and that's how it's framed but it's not sensitive enough when we have a 40 percent decline in our population of birds it's not detecting that that decline in population and saying hey we need to be adaptive we got to back off hunting that's not what our framework currently does and so we got a 40 percent decline in, in overall population but yet we're still in a liberal season that for this next hunting season all across the, the midwest you know the the mid-continent flyways and so it's you know it's slightly you know, it's slightly concerning that the framework that we use to set harvest regulations doesn't all that much take into account the 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 resource and the condition of the population at that time. And so, just because it's not sensitive enough, and so I think there's some changes coming. There's a lot of young, really good population ecologist scientists coming up. Uh, that's starting to make some noise on different types of models that can help drive what hunting season should look like so that we can maintain a, a goal of, you know, eight, 10 million birds, whatever that might be in the, in the mid continent. So, so I think there's some, you know, there's a lot of noise now. There's some rumbling. There's states that are, there's states that are making uh, changes to hunting policies right now that, don't follow the federal guidelines, right? The right. feds say you can shoot six ducks, but any of the states can say, "Hey, I don't want to shoot six. We're going to shoot five. States are allowed to to be to do less than what the the fed uh, policy allows. And so, you know, we see we've seen this year the the Texas has taken the conservation order out of goose season. No more conservation goose hunting in Texas. Right, and that's yeah. Texas made their own Concerned decision. There. Yeah, yeah, they say, hey, we're going to be more, we're going to be more conservative here because we don't think, you know, we think that uh, we don't have enough birds or whatever, whatever ultimately decision. They don't think that the conservation order is is uh, is needed anymore. I think you know it may have achieved its goal and say, hey, we don't, we we personally don't think it needs to be, we don't need to be chasing birds. And you know the end of January, February here, and stirring all the other birds, all the water, you know the the dabbling ducks up and all that. So whatever decisions ultimately of why that was done, but we're starting to see some states be leaders in the field and say, hey, we've we've seen enough, we're done, and that's what Texas has done with the conservation order. We're currently going through the regulation process right now. The uh, in Arkansas. Uh, hunting regulation through the commission and um and right now they have proposed uh they actually have proposed in arkansas to reduce the hen bag limit to one instead of two um and so you know they they we don't quite have enough real data to support the fact that if we reduce hen harvest by by one it'll impact um the population all that much we wish we had some more data i personally think i have the data in my hand that we're about to start analyzing this summer and so i think we hopefully can support that decision uh within the next year and say hey this is why we think it's really a good idea so we hope that the state would go ahead and the commissioners would vote on uh, the one hen for this year give us a chance to do this analysis be a little bit proactive right instead of reactive on things right let's be a little proactive and say hey we don't shoot hen turkeys do we i'm with we don't you shoot or hen pheasants, pheasants do we? or hen quail i'm 100 percent on that buddy i believe that i would be the first advocate to say that hey you know i would either go to no hens or one hen you know, um, yeah. you're still going to have those who can't identify, you know, more than that or get are getting shot. I'm, I do believe that hunters can be the best conservationists out there. What yeah. scares me when you put it um, 
in the hands of government, you know, as long as it, like you said, that there's people out there who are good young people who care about the, you know, the conservation of, of these, of our birds and then, and the water, the wildfowl. If, the, if, if decisions are being made on based on facts and not politics and when they're based yeah. on, you know, it's always what scares me with the government. I'm just going to say once they take something away, you know, and especially in today's age when you're worried about guns and everything else that, you know, trying to get that back. But when you got people out there who are it's sound facts that, hey, I'm the first one in there. I just want to be out there and be able to sit in the field. I don't have to, you know, shoot a whole limit. And I don't base my success that every time I'm out there that I have clobbered a bunch of ducks or everything like that. Man, I'd be happy, you know, if you shot your two, three ducks or whatever they come to um, and shoot a couple geese. And, I mean, that's a great day for anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greed greed is terrible. I think think in Arkansas, you know, the one hand limit could work. The birds are as green and as brown as possible here. I mean, if, yeah. if you're if you're careful, you know the they change the the number of points on a deer to have certain amount of points before you can shoot it on public land. They, there may have been some complaints at first, but people are seeing the response of the population and say, "Hey, we're getting bigger deer." Yeah, and 100%. you're going to take the time and you're going to make sure you can you can tell what how many points that deer has or you know or or if that if that goblin bird has a has a has a long beard or a little short stubby beard if you're going to shoot it or not so it's like why can't we take a second and make sure we're taking and putting good shots on on mallard ducks and that we take an opportunity to shoot the green ones when we can Absolutely. and so there's going to be accidents i know i you know i i've killed i i mean we all kill hands and so we can't take the limit completely away but we think this far south and in the in the flyway they can work you know it may be tougher clean up north when when birds are still not fully molted out and all that stuff so it may not work continent wide but if we can do it in some portions of the of the country in a flyway then we think you know you know if they if they say you know why sh- if, if it's a hen mallard it's got a chance to lay eggs why should we just kill it when there's a, other op- potential opportunities to, to shoot the drakes if we can it's like let's give her a chance she may die on the prairies anyway a predator may get her but hey let's not make it the gun but if i kill her she definitely isn't gonna downfall. make it yeah, yeah that's the way I looked at gun her downfall. Yep. You know, I, I agree with that 100%. When we were up in Saskatchewan the first week of September, we went up there and we filmed a show with Bushnell Prairie Pursuit. That's on their um, wild TV channel. And uh, Greg Toogood and went up there. And, man, we hunted uh, way north of Yorkton, Saskatchewan. That was awesome. You know, we knew we were early. And I said, this has got to be a Canada goose hunt. Because, uh, you know, I don't want to get in shooting, just shooting ducks. And the first morning uh, we sat there and those guys, you know, they went their round of shooting ducks. And I looked at them. I said, guys, I, I'm not shooting. I can't see. A, I can't. I'm going to have a hard time seeing a green head. And I'm not just going to shoot ducks. You know, when it's just me, you got to have a conscience. And then also you got to have some morals and, and response. So, you know what? They had no problem. We didn't shoot ducks. Just because, you know, I, I'm not just going to blast ducks and hope, I get, you know, that they're green because they're immature. They weren't even, you know, so you're right. It is up to the hunter to be responsible. We have to, to stand and make uh, good ethical decisions. And the government can't stand there and, and you guys can't stand there. And, you know, we have to take some responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Man, it's our sport. We love this. We we all all of us hunters want to want to harvest, take a nice bag of ducks home with us, you know. But we also we also want good duck hunting next year and ten years and for our kids and whatever else. And so I think, you know, it's all it's all of our responsibilities to to think about the decisions that we we make as individuals. And you know, I could I could say, you know what, I I really think that we should have a three duck limit or two duck limit a day and that's it. And so me as a person, I should just go out and stop shooting four ducks a day and start shooting two and, and unloading my gun and say, I'm going to, I'm good with that. I'm happy with two ducks. That's all. That's about what my family will, you know, consume anyway. If I had that many ducks in the fruit, that's about how many we'll eat. We don't, you know, and just, 
just make sure that I'm consuming what I, I just, I know too many hunters that don't even eat ducks, uh, you know? That's and it's truth. like, they just, they want to go out and shoot their six ducks, but their family don't even eat them. But and it's so all that, ego. You know, that's sort of, that's sort of like, you know, I know it's a sport, but also it's, uh, you know, let's consume our game and make sure that we're being responsible conservationists in the whole. You know, that's scheme. a great, a great point. I mean, the turkey population, when you've seen people complaining, they, they were they were going down. And, you know, my wife and I could legally shoot four turkeys here in Iowa, and we were shooting some great turkeys. Average weight of 27 pounds on our last four turkeys. But when the population started declining, you know, then we went, we shot one apiece. And then in the worst year ever that I've seen, you know what? I never shot a turkey. She never shot a turkey. We just, uh, yeah. you know, there's, I don't. I, I like to get up in the morning and hear those gobbles throughout the woods. And when you get a season where you don't hear gobbling, then, you, you know, you know something's wrong and you can lose it. I know on yeah. social media that also uh, after the snow goose season, I heard guys talking that they st- saw birds up in the Dakotas and stuff and on the water holes that were walking like they were lethargic. And so guys were claiming that the, the birds were going through the avian flu um, there was a bunch of talk on that. Was there anything in your studies that, you know, say, you know, this is true or not true or anything? The, yeah, the AI, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the geese are much more susceptible to having sort of uh, outward appearance. Like you can see that they have AI in the geese, especially in the white geese. Um you know, I, I don't know why it, it affects them so much more. We know that there's evidence of AI in, in duck populations, but a lot of times some of the ducks that they have found positive for AI had no symptoms, outward appearance, you know, no symptoms of it that we could tell. And uh, and so it's just interesting that it, it, I don't think it has the uh, – it's not having the, the – um, you know, it's just not having the, the effect on ducks as much as it is on geese, although the ducks are getting it. Um, I do think, I would say, from my understanding, that the, the prevalence of it in ducks is, is relatively low. It's not just a full-blown outbreak in this, in a, you know. It, and, uh, and then in geese, it's, I think it's pretty spotty, but it when it hits a, a flock, I think it can have pretty good detrimental impacts on you know a good number of birds and so ai comes and goes and but it's in it's definitely uh the high path ai is definitely something that they've they've been concerned about and and other you know i know some folks in alaska and and, and louisiana study are pretty good in georgia some uh, folks there that do the analysis but they're they're head deep in in some of that and the impacts it may have on on uh, various aspects of the population or breeding and that kind of thing. And so they're looking at it, but, but yeah, that's just another, another piece of the puzzle. I mean, everything wants to kill a duck, you know, and <laughs> uh, disease and habitat wants to kill a duck and a, a, a mammal and a hunter and like turtles, no chance, you know, yeah, but, turtles so we don't gotta, realize it's going to be, we just got to make good decisions, I think, as conservationists. I had a good friend in Michigan had a, a big, big pond. And uh, he would tell, you know, he would always tell the story every year that uh, when the baby ducks were on their ponds and stuff, that the snapping turtles ended up, would eliminate almost every baby duck that was on the pond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mother yeah, Nature's cool. Definitely, yeah. Well, Doug, I appreciate, a, buddy. Yeah. Uh, anything you want to add that you're working in, you know, anything new? Oh man, we we got some. Uh, we're really focused on hen mallards now. We're trying to look at su- survival of hens from February, at, you know, post hunting season through the breeding season. How many of our birds are 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 making it? You know, how many of these hens are making it to the prairies? Are they stopping? Are they breeding within the prairies? Uh, what pattern? You know, are, are they? You know, how, when they get to the prairies, how many ponds do they look at before they decide where the nest? And, you know, how much energy they spend in looking for nesting habitat and, and how successful are they? So we're really kind of getting into, you know, what's their survival rate? Um, how many of those hens are going to come back sort of a second breeding season uh, that have backpacks? You know, and so we're just really trying to dive into some more understanding of the ecology and survival 
of, of Hen Mallards. So hopefully, you know, hopefully just is going to help inform what may be going on at, at the population level. So we're excited about that. Um, and again, I'm, 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 I'm heavily involved in a bunch of forest re, uh, reforestation of bottom and hardwood projects right now, and uh, and looking at mallard use around uh, around the use of uh, sort of reforestation and that kind of deal. So some new some new some neat new avenues that we're working on. But man, I just you know I just I, I'm grateful for my all, all the folks that work for me and awesome students that, that come in and with brilliant ideas and, and hard work ethic and that kind of thing. And just, you know, we're just, I'm happy to, you know, that my students are getting jobs in, in natural resource fields and management agencies, and they're going to be the next ones that are ma- making these management decisions. So I'm kind of, you know, well, I you- fill them up. I fill their ear with as much information I can now so that they, you know, to help them, in the future, but I look forward to a bunch of my students, uh, you know, being in management roles. Uh, well, you're definitely putting, a, yeah, you're definitely putting a bunch of young men and women in some great positions with some great knowledge, and hopefully will be in the help of uh, protecting the future of our water waterfowl. How did the the wonders of waterfowl do this year? Oh, George, it was a great event. Um, Tiffany, my wife, uh, does this 4-H event with the Wonders of Waterfowl and, and teaches these kids about, uh, you know, about all the ecology and, and threats of the species. And, and boy, it is it. Her event fills up so quickly. She, you know, she limits it to maybe about 50 kids in 4-H. Um, you know, so that they can make sure that they get good hands-on experience while they're there. They're not a number. They're we want them getting their hands dirty with us. We put them in waders and some of them show up and, you know, they don't have waders, which most of them, we don't ask them to bring them, uh, you know, but mostly I got size 10, 11, 12 waders. And so we got kids out there and waders that are four times too big, you know, swamping around out there, digging up insects and aquatic invertebrates out of the marsh and learning, learning to identify these things and looking for duck food. And so I think it's just, we, we hope that it really opens the eyes of these young kids and and uh, and gets them excited about continuing to be hunting and, and and understanding you know the ecology of the duck that they are hunting and uh, and we hope that some of these kids go into natural resource fields and you know come join my program someday so so you know your support of that last year was incredible. And, uh, and Tiffany's just always looking for uh, for sponsors to that deal and uh, the impact that it has on these young kids. And that's why I would recommend any of you folks listening out there, any of you guys that are sportsmen that maybe you don't have kids, this is a wonderful. Diane and I were just so proud to be part of this and would like to continue to help support where we can in the future. But this is a great opportunity and uh, reach out, check it out on their their website. And if you'd like to donate or be a supporter of this, I highly recommend this is a, a great program to contribute to. And, you know, in, in, in other states out there, I think that all states should be doing this stuff and, and all hunting areas of people that have for the, for our youth, one thing, you know, to get them away from the social medias and the pressure of life itself and all the negativity on TV and uh, how our world is, kids need an escape. And this is, uh, you know, great mentors out there. And there is some good people. But each state, if they, you know, get a hold of your wife or look it up and, and you know, try to start their own in their own state just for these kids. But it is my hats off to what you guys, what you're doing and the lives that you're affecting. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And folks, uh, like again, if you like this podcast, hit the like button, subscribe. But I'd like to thank Doug again, spending his busy time scratching his head. This guy, you don't realize it's, it's a, you know, it's uh it's in a passion, you know, that they have that creates this obsession and uh, it's about caring and it's not about money it's not about fame it's about you know being good and being the best uh, of you know trying to make the best situation but anyway i appreciate it doug and i tell you what folks i appreciate you and uh, again it's, uh, check out us at legendarygearusa.com check out our podcast check out the george lynch hunting podcast I also do a podcast on the Outdoor Call Radio on Wednesday. Folks, I hope you always remember hunt safe, 
hunt smart, and may the good Lord be your guide. Well, I'll be out there rain shining on the part of the great design. Bring it on, I can never get enough. Because that's what legends are made of.